right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you guys here today. Um, as you guys know, we have a special guest in the crowd today. Um, we have our Mine and Haley's new baby, Ayla, who is with us, Yay. which is awesome. So good job. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, mostly clapping for Haley, of course. She had to do the hard work. Yes. Uh, but I had to do something. You know, I stood there. Um, but uh, also, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you that reached out, um, who were willing to help. Those of you that brought food, thank you so much for that. And um, thanks for the dags for watching our crazy children for a couple of days um, until Haley's mom got in town, which is awesome as well. Um, but I just want to say thank you guys for your prayers, and I know that God protected us and everything went well, so thank you guys for that so, so much. All right, well, um, we're going to be in the book of Haggai today, Haggai. So that is, um, that is in the Old Testament, one of the last few books there in the Old Testament, the book of Haggai, if you want to open up with us today. We're continuing um, this series, and we're actually finishing it out today today on the series called God With Us. And we talked about how uh, Jesus is the Emmanuel. He is God with us. And how he's been with us. We talked the last couple weeks how he's with us through the valleys, through those kind of long, kind of hard, drier times in our lives. He's with us when we're kind of in the wilderness, when we've kind of departed away from him, and we've kind of had a rough time, that God is still with us in that. But there's another time when God is with us, and that is just in the everyday, mundane parts of our life. You know, a lot of times when we think of God being with us, right, we have these, these high views of these kind of extraordinary moments of God being with us, especially like when we look at the scriptures, right? When we look at the scriptures, we see these stories of God being with people in these extraordinary moments. We think of David, right? David, who um, was just a young shepherd boy going up against Goliath, who has been trained in all of this battle and war, and he's huge, and he has all his armor and all his weaponry, and David goes with a slingshot, and God gives him the strength to take him out, right? And God was with David in that extraordinary moment. Or we think of Jonah, Jonah, right, who is, got swallowed up by the fish and was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Yet God was with him, and God protected him and let him out of that. And he went on to cause a revival throughout all of Nineveh. Or we think of we think of Job, who went through one of the worst experiences anyone could ever experience. Right? His family was killed. His kids were killed. All of his material possessions taken away. Even his own wife kind of turned against him at one point. Right? And yet God was with him, and God provided everything that he needed and, and blessed him even more than he had before or we think of Lazarus right who literally died and yet Jesus was there to resurrect him and when we're reading through the scriptures it's easy for us to kind of look at our own lives as well and to say like yeah I understand that God is with me when I'm feeling all the blessings right all the blessings of God seem to be raining down upon me and I understand in those moments and I feel God and I understand that he's there or even when we're going through those hardships and those difficult times in our lives and we're going through difficult things where we feel weak and we understand even at those moments that God is there comforting us and helping us and providing for us and protecting us. But there's something that we often forget and something that maybe we don't live out as faithfully as we need to. And that is the fact that God is with us in the everyday mundane parts of our life. Right? Um, he's with us every single day. And this is, this is so important to remember because it's in the everyday that is where we spent the majority of our life, right? We have these high points, we have these low points, but those are kind of, kind of in between. Everything else is just everyday mundane life, right? We wake up, we go to work, we are with our family, we eat dinner, we hang out, we go to sleep. All this again and again and again is just kind of mundane. But even in those mundane parts of our lives, God is with us. There's this um, um, Christian author, pastor, his name is Paul David Tripp. And if you haven't read any of his books, I highly recommend them. Um, he's a great write, writer and really speaks to the heart. But he tells a story that kind of illustrates this point about his life. Um, he talked about how him and his wife, and I'll kind of paraphrase the story, but him and his wife are, are very different, right? His wife, Llewellyn. And he talked about how Llewellyn, her whole attitude of life was thinking that the party didn't ever start until she showed up, right? And so, like, it didn't matter how late she was, doesn't matter, there's time frames, doesn't matter, you know, she'll just get there when she gets there. And he said that he was raised where, by a guy, by a man, who thought the sole litmus test of a human being was punctuality, right? And so, like, you had to be on time for everything, not just on time, but way early. 
And so obviously this would cause a lot of conflict in their marriage. And so he was, uh, they were planning to go out to this one place, this one event, one night. And he, the, right about the time when they were supposed to leave. So if they didn't leave at this time, they knew they were going to be late. And he goes into his bedroom, goes into the bathroom, and there's his wife standing at the mirror. And it was clear that they were nowhere close to leaving, right? And so this angered him. He got frustrated. And so Paul started kind of like raising his voice, yelling at his wife and being like, why are you ready? We got to go, da, 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 da. What he didn't realize, though, is that his five-year-old son was sitting right there in the bathroom as well. And as he's, like, getting his anger out and everything, his five-year-old son looks up at him and says, Daddy, is that how Jesus would talk to Mommy? Right? <laughs> and now he's like, he like, obviously, at that moment, moment, he didn't receive that too well. He's like, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And he walked out. And as he's walking through the bedroom, before he gets out the bedroom door, it just hits him. Right? Just the truth of what his son had said. Like, yeah, that wasn't Christ-like the way I treated her and the way I raised my voice and all these things, right? But he said in that moment, there's something that even hit him even harder than that. is the fact that in this kind of seemingly everyday mundane moment where they were just getting ready to do something, to go somewhere, that God would use his son to speak truth into his life, Right? It's in those everyday moments that God would be there caring about this family in this one moment that seems unimportant. But God cared about them and God wanted to change even in that mundane, everyday moment. And that's the thing with us as well. God doesn't just care about us and he's not just there for us when we're going through the high points in life or when we're going through the low points in life. He's there for us every single second of every single day. And he cares about the mundane, everyday parts of our lives. And this passage in Haggai, it really illustrates this point. We see a group of people that are kind of just going through the motions of this everyday work. And it doesn't seem too fantastic. It's not amazing. Nothing extraordinary is happening. It's just going about their day to day. And yet God is with them through it all. So we're going to start off today in Haggai chapter 2 in verse one through four. Haggai chapter two and verse one through four. We're going to go back between chapter one and chapter two, but we'll start here. <coughs> it says this, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jostek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Joshua, and the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. So God speaks to these people and he tells them that a very important, amazing thing that he is with them. Now, I understand that probably for um, some of you, you're like, Haggai, that's even a book in the Bible? What's going on, right? Um, so I'll give you kind of some background to what's going on here in Haggai okay, and where we're at in the biblical story. So at one point in Israel's history, Israel split into two kingdoms. You have a northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. The northern king of Israel, they had nothing but basically evil kings, and eventually they were wiped out. But Judah hang on, hang on, hang, uh, hung on for a little while longer, right? They had some good kings, some bad kings. But eventually what happened, and Judah's where Jerusalem was at, is the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, came in and he wiped out um, Judah. He, he tore down um, the walls around Jerusalem. It just became, a, Jerusalem became a place of ruin. The temple was ruined, the houses, everything. If you think of it like World War II and in, the, um, in Europe with all the buildings just being bombed out and things like that. So all the people there, though, were carried away into captivity into Babylon, right? And this is where we get the stories of, like, of Daniel and things like this, right? But after a while, the Babylonian kingdom was defeated by the Persian kingdom. And then there's a Persian king named Cyrus. And God kind of touched his heart in a special way where Cyrus allowed some of the people, some of these Israelites, to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild their kingdom. Right, to go back to there and to rebuild the city, but most importantly, to rebuild the temple. And so God sends, during this time, he sends several prophets, the last 
three books of the Old Testament are these prophets that go to these people that are rebuilding Jerusalem. Haggai was the first. And this actually is going on at the same time, if you read in the Old Testament, of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Those events are happening at the same time. So, after 70 years in exile, 70 years of being kind of prisoners in another land that is not their own, they're allowed to return home to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and to rebuild the temple. So this is where we pick it up in Haggai chapter 1. And we'll start in verse 2. Here's what goes on. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. It says this, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie in waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, and you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is no warmth. You have earned wages only to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, talking about the temple. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in waste, and you run every man to his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So what happened here is as the people have returned, right, they started. They got started on the temple, but then what they did is they just stopped. After a while, they didn't finish the temple, and instead what they did it says here that they, they went to their sealed houses or their paneled houses. It said they stopped focusing on the temple and they started putting all their focus just on their own houses. And so the idea there that it was paneled, that it was sealed, it was the idea that it was completely roofed, every part of the house was finished out, it was perfect. And yet God is saying your house that you spent all this time on is perfect condition, everything's put together, and yet my house, the temple, is still in complete waste. There's nothing good there. It's completely left abandoned. And he tells them two times in this passage to consider your ways. Because here's what happened. They had gone to Jerusalem with this fervor in their heart to rebuild the temple, to do what God wanted them to do. But now they started to neglect God's path, neglect God's ways, and instead what they did is focus on themselves. They neglected the things of God, and because of that, they were not experiencing the blessings of God. And that's the same thing that happened to us. When we neglect God's ways and God's path, we don't experience His blessings. Look what it says in verse 6. It says, You have sown much, and you planted a lot, but you bring in little. Their crop wasn't very great. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, you're not filled with drink. You clothe, but you're not warm. You earn wages and earn wages to be put into a bag with holes. He's saying here that they are working hard. They're trying to give life their all, but nothing seems to be enough. Nothing seems to be working out. Nothing seems to be going their way. And here's the truth. Life is always harder when you choose not to follow the path of God. When you choose to not follow God's path, life is always inevitably going to be harder for you. I remember when I, I worked at a place... A while back, and um, for a while, I was the only Christian in my workplace. And even though I was working at the same place as these other people, and I was doing the same things, their lives of the other my coworkers were just kind of in shambles, just falling apart. And they would look at my life, and they would say, "Why does everything seem to be working out?" And I said, "It's very simple. You just do what this says, right?" And that's one of the biggest proofs of the Word of God to me is that if you just follow what God says, you get to experience His blessing. But if we neglect what God tells us to do, we don't experience the blessings that God has for us in this life. If we choose to disobey what God says about relationships, right, we end up in pain and heartbreak. If we choose to disobey what God says about treating others, we end up lonely and bitter. If we choose to disobey what God says about serving Him, we end up unfulfilled and depressed. But if you follow the path that God has laid out, it just works better. And all of a sudden, God blesses and multiplies your work to be better than you could have possibly ever 
imagine. And that's where they were at. They had left off of God's word, became so self-absorbed that they weren't experiencing the blessings of God, and God calls them out on it. But here's what they do. In verse 12, it says this, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people did fear before the Lord. So they get back to doing what they're supposed to do. They obey the voice of the Lord. They obey the commandments of God. They obey the path that God has wanted them to walk down. And then look what happens in verse 13. Because of their obedience, it says this, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger unto the, the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So because they got back to obedience with the Lord, they experienced the presence of God. And here's the truth. God's presence is always more felt when you're walking on God's path. God's presence is always more felt when you're walking on God's path. Just like we learned last week, Elijah, right, when he got into a hard spot, he went off the path of God and decided to do his own thing for a while. And he didn't experience the presence of the Lord in those moments because he got off of God's path. And they, too, they got off of the path, became self-focused, focusing on their own house. But when they returned to the work of the Lord, returned to rebuilding the temple, they experienced God's presence in a more palpable way. However, just because they got started down this path of obedience, getting back to what God had called them to do, it didn't mean everything was easy. It didn't mean everything happened quickly. It didn't mean that there was tons of excitement in that. It actually kind of meant the opposite. It just meant like they were kind of in the middle of this mundane. But here's the thing. God was with them even when it looks like there's no progress. Look at verse chapter 2 and verse 1 or verse 3. Verse 3, this is what God, he comes to him again. It's been about a month of time working on the temple. And he says this, Who is left among you that saw the house in her first glory? Talking about that first temple before it was destroyed. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So here's what happened. The people had gotten to work. They started to rebuild the temple. But God kind of calls them out after a month's time working day in and day out. And this work was tedious and this work was long, right? Rebuilding the temple, they didn't have the machinery that we had. So sometimes when they would hew out a huge stone, it could take them all day working to move that stone even 20 yards to another place, right? And when they would do that, it would do this long, drawn-out process to lay the foundations of the temple to start to rebuild it day in and day out working for this month. And God calls them out on what they're feeling in their heart. Because even though they've been working so hard, it seemed like nothing was changing. It didn't seem like anything impressive was happening. He calls out these older men. He says, who's among you that remembers the former temple? Right? That remembers the old days when you saw the temple. Because there's it had been about 70 years, but there were still some people around that were really young as kids, maybe teenagers, that had seen the temple in all of its glory. And that temple, the first temple, Solomon's temple, was absolutely glorious. I mean, it was, it was over 180,000 people worked to complete this temple at different times. It was covered in gold. The Bible describes that, that even the floors themselves were paved with gold. It was beautiful of a place. And you know how, like, when you're a kid, you have these, like, poor memories of places, right? Like, you guys know I grew up in Hawaii, but I was born in Texas. And for the first few years of my life, I grew up in this small town called Junction, Texas. And in Junction, there's this river that runs through the town. There's this large bridge that goes over this river. And I have these, like, core memories of being a child and swimming in that river, riding my bike across the bridge, right? And even though it was years and years that I spent away from there, I still remember it. And that's where these people are at. They remember the former temple. They remember how beautiful it was and how awesome it was. But now they're looking at all the work they're pouring into this temple now, and it seems as nothing. In, in Ezra, which is, again is the parallel passage to this, he had described their feeling in Ezra chapter 3, and verse 12. It says, But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice. 
See, they saw the foundation relayed, and they weren't crying because they were happy. They were crying because it seemed like nothing. It seemed so worthless to them. Because these people, they didn't have the riches that Solomon had. Remember, they're returning for, after being exiled for 70 years. They're returning to a city that is destroyed. And so they're using the tools that they had left over. They're using these blocks that they had left over from their rubble around. It's not impressive. It's not amazing to them. And they're weeping over this. And they're sad. See, sometimes that's how our lives are as, as well. Sometimes it seems like we're working at things and we're trying our best. But it seems like everything we're doing is amounting to nothing. It doesn't seem like any significant uh, progress is made at all. Um, You guys know that New Year's is coming up like right around the corner, right? And so this is the time of year where everyone and their dogs decides to go on a diet, right? And um, and so on New Year's Day, this is what's going to happen. People are going to wake up. They're going to go stand in front of their mirror. They're going to take their little selfie picture of themselves. And they're going to look at themselves and they're like, all right, no more of that. I'm going to be better, right? And then what happens is they start to diet. They go into their cabinet. They get the Doritos. They toss those out. They start eating raw kale back and forth. Um, They go and they start exercising every day. They go to the 16th Avenue tile steps and they crawl up those every five times a day. And then about after like a week, they go into their, their, their bathroom. They go stand on their scale. They look down. They're like, half a pound, right? And then they go look at themselves in the mirror and they're like, I look worse than before. And then they quit back to the Doritos we go, right? Um, Forget the kale. And and this is the thing, though, right? This is how life works. If you're not willing to put down the time, then you're not going to see the results. A lot of times we expect to see results in our lives as we're living out, we're working hard, we expect them to see them right away, but results don't come without putting in the time. Like That works in a lot of different avenues of our life, in relationships, right? If we're not willing to put the time and effort and work into a relationship, then it's not going to grow. I mean, we think we had a wedding. Our church celebrated a wedding with John and Amy this past, this year, right? And if they would have met one time and decided, you know what, we're not going to work on this thing, they wouldn't be married. But besides, they both worked on it. They both worked together and continue to work on their marriage. Then their relationship flourishes and grows. Or in our jobs, right? We don't show up the first week of the job, work a week, and say, you know what, boss? I need a promotion now, right? He's going to be like, what are you talking about? You've only been here a week, right? Sometimes it takes years of hard work and dedication to get that promotion. Or maybe it is like dieting and weight loss goals or whatever else. It takes time. And so if life works like that in almost every other area and sphere of life, why would we think it would be any different with our relationship with God? See, our relationship with God doesn't flourish and blossom overnight. Our relationship with God takes time to work on and to grow. I mean, I know how it is. Sometimes when we read, when we go in to read our Bibles, right? And we go in and we read and we're like, hmm, didn't really get anything out of that, right? Or sometimes when you pray and it feels like your, your prayers are just going off into the ethos and you have no idea if it's even working or if God's even listening. Or sometimes you gather with the church and serve in the church and you don't feel like you're growing like you should be or you feel like things aren't working out. You feel like God is not with us. And so in those times, what do we do? A lot of times we just quit. We give up. We stop reading. We stop praying. We stop attending. We stop serving. We stop doing these things. And that is the worst thing that we could ever do with our walk with the Lord. Because as the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? And our relationship with Christ isn't going to be built in a week or a month. It is this. It is the consistent faithfulness over years that leads to progress and growth in our walk with the Lord. Consistent faithfulness over years leads to progress and growth. You know, you run a mile one time, right? You're going to be tired and you're not going to experience anything different in your life. But if you run a mile every day for a year, you're going to see some results and some differences same thing. Our Bible reading is sporadic. Guess what? We're not going to grow. We're not going to, the Bible reading is going to seem tedious and confusing. But if we read our Bibles daily, we will grow. There's this old kid song. I don't know if you guys, for those of you that didn't grow up in church, you probably missed out on this amazing song. But it goes like this, okay? And I'll sing it for you. (laughs) All right? It says, Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. And it does that like a thousand times. Um, And then it says, 
don't read your Bible, forget to pray, and you shrink, 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 right? Now, it's so simple of a song, but the, the key idea is so important. If we read, if we study, if we grow faithfully, consistently, every day, we grow. But if we just give up and quit or, not in, or we're inconsistent, we're not going to grow. Sometimes when we're trying our best, God is not providing or doing the things that we want him to do. We're not seeing him show up exactly the way he want, we want him to show up. But here's the thing. The presence and provision of God don't always add up to our definition of success. Just because we don't experience success in the way we think we should be experiencing it doesn't mean that God's provision and his protection and his presence are not just as much there. That's what these people were doing. They were crying over it because they had worked for a month putting together this temple and they're looking at it and it seems like nothing compared to what their expectation was. But God's presence and his provision were just as much there with them in that moment as it ever was. You know, we have an enemy. Our enemy, Satan, he doesn't want us to be consistent in our walk with God. He doesn't want us to go back to the Lord's work. He's going to try everything he can to throw distractions in our way so our walk with God is inconsistent and all over the place. But we're not faithfully living out our faith every day. Or, and another subtle tactic that he uses, is he tries to get us to chase the wrong thing. And sometimes, as Christians, we start to chase a feeling or experience more than we chase faithfulness. And when I was a youth pastor for several years, it was my job to kind of take the kids to youth camp. So I took these group of teenagers to youth camp every single year. And this is what's so cool about youth camp, but also you can kind of see the sadness about it, is that you go to youth camp for a whole week, right? All the distractions are removed from these kids. No phones, no Netflix, nothing in their lives that are distracting to them at all. And then what they do is they just spend all their ta time having fun, playing games, being in fellowship with other Christians, they hear preaching multiple times a day. They're in their word doing devotion. So by the end of that week, by Friday night, everyone is jazzed up, right? Everyone is so excited, passionate. They're ready to charge hell with the super soaker, right? They're, they're on fire for the Lord. But then what happens is they go home. All those distractions come back in. And by that next week, you ask them, hey, how's your Bible reading? Do it? Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't even read my Bible this week. And that's the thing. And the same thing can happen to us as adults. Like, if we chase experiences, right, where we go to a concert, and we can get this high after being at a Christian concert where we're around other people, and there's not wrong with that. It's just the fact is sometimes we chase those experiences more than daily consistent faithfulness with the Lord. And here's the thing, okay? Experiences, they'll fill us for a day, but faithfulness fills us for a life. Faithfulness with God will fill you for a life. But if you chase experiences or you're so still getting your Bible and you expect every day to be some incredible, amazing thing, you're going to be chasing those things. You'll be filled for a day and end up empty. See, God is so near to us. The Bible tells us that. He's so close. But if we would just reach out to Him in faithful consistency every day, He promises us that we will find Him. This is how Jesus put it in Matthew 5, 6. He says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we're really hungry for God, if we're really thirsting after His righteousness, we really want what God wants, we will be filled. That's a promise from Jesus. The question becomes, do we really want to know Jesus? Do we really want to get closer to Him? Do we want to live a life that is spirit-filled? Do we want to feel God close to us daily? And if that is true, then we have to be faithfully consistent day in and day out, even in the mundane parts of our life, walking with God. Sometimes that means it'll feel like no progress is being made. But if you stay faithful, you'll see the great things that God can do. You know, just imagine what the disciples must have felt. God, Jesus calls his disciples, and so for three long years, they walk with him day in and day out. Through all, not just the amazing miracles, but also just the mundane parts of life. Camping out, making a fire, eating, fishing. 
And through all of those long three years, the end comes where Jesus dies on the cross. The one that they have been following is dead. Can you imagine what they must have felt in that moment? Must have felt that everything, all the work that they put in for three years amounted to nothing. Like it was worthless. Why did we even do that? Why did we spend all that time? Then just three days later, Christ resurrected from the dead. And a few days after that, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out into the streets. Thousands of people became saved. Churches were started all over the known world. God used them to write the New Testament. And here's the truth. If any one of them would have just decided, you know what, we're just going to give up. It's not worth the mundane, everyday work. It's not worth staying with Jesus. If they would have just given up, we wouldn't have the church today. We wouldn't have the truth of God's word. We wouldn't know Christ. But because they stayed faithful, consistent with Jesus, God used them to spread his gospel throughout the entire world. They stayed faithfully consistent. And God blessed their work. The same thing with these people here in Haggai. Because they were working and doing this day in and day out, they didn't quit. They saw the temple built, and it took them over 40 years. But here's what God also did for them. God was with them for their strength and their work. Look at verse 4. He tells them this. After he says, you look, I know what you're looking at right now seems like nothing, but in verse 4, yet. Now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Joshua, and high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. So in their mundane, everyday grind of life, there's a promise. A promise from God that even in the mundane, I am with you. But along that promise, there also came a command. The command for the mundane parts of life was, be strong and work. The word for strong in the Hebrew, it it means actually to like grow in strength, right? To grow in your strength, to bind. It also has this idea of courage that is carried out with it. So in Joshua 1.7, the same word for be strong is used when God is telling Joshua to lead the people of Israel. When he says to be strong and be of good courage, that you may prosper. You know, Joshua had to endure entering into the land of Canaan. He had to lead the Israelites. He had to face the walls of Jericho. He had to go through battle after battle. Yet he didn't quit. He remained strong and courageous. And the Lord used him to lead the Israelites into the promised land. But the thing that gave him his courage, the thing that gave him his strength was not the fact that he was just naturally strong and had all these abilities. It was the fact that God was with him. He got his strength from the Lord, and that's who he looked to for his help. Psalm 121, 1 through 2 says this, I will lift my eyes into the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. It's the Lord that gives us strength. Is the Lord that allows us to go on day in and day out, to grind, to work, to live this life in the mundane. And if we remain in him, we can experience his strength every single day. The second command, though, is not just to be strong. But the second command he gives is to get to the work. To work. Now, just because God's going to give us this strength, it doesn't mean that we get to sit back and do nothing. Right? It doesn't mean that we just get to let God build the temple by himself. No, the people had to get to work. They had to do that work every day. And if they would have stopped, they would have never seen it finished. But because they kept strong and faithful, continued to work, later on what happened is it actually helped their work, it helped their ministry later on. So like I told you, Ezra and Nehemiah is going on during the time. So as they are building the temple... Years later, what happens is a guy named Nehemiah is called by the Lord, feels feels God's call to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. So so Nehemiah rolls in the town and he goes up to the people. And this is what he tells them in chapter 2 of verse 18 of Nehemiah. He says, Then I told them of how the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he spoke unto me. And this is what the people said. Let us rise up and build. 
So they strengthened. It's that same word that God uses for be strong. It says they strengthened their hands for this good, what? This good work. See, here's what happens. God had to tell them here at the temple. He said, hey, get up, be strong, work. But because they did that and lived faithfully for the Lord, years later when another call of God is on their lives, they don't have to have God to come and tell them what to do. They know what to do, to get up, to be strong, and to get to work. And that's what happens in our lives, too. When we live faithfully for the Lord, and we stay faithfully for Him, all of a sudden those things that were weaknesses at the beginning for us, they're no longer weaknesses anymore. Those sins that we couldn't overcome, we stay faithful. We work with the Lord, and He allows us to overcome them. And we become stronger and stronger in our walk with God as the years go by. That's what happened with them. They became stronger and stronger where they didn't have to have God come in and tell them they knew what they were supposed to do. The same thing happens with us in life. When we're walking with the Lord and we obey Him consistently over time, we get stronger in our walk with the Lord. We grow more faithful. And those things that used to cause us problems, we're able to defeat and go on stronger in the Lord than we were before. One thing that helps us to stay strong is the fact that God is with us continuing to keep His promises. Look at verse 5, what He tells them. In verse 5, he goes on the very next verse. He says, according to the word that I covenanted with you. The word covenant, it's just like this strong promise. That I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not. He tells them again, I'm going to keep my promise that I made to you guys. You are my people. I'm going to establish my kingdom through you. And then he tells them this. He said, my spirit is still with you. Again, for the third time in this passage, we see God tells them and reminds them, I am with you. And because he is with them, because he keeps their promises, he gives them this exhortation. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Because God always keeps his promises. One thing we can always rely on is this. God is always, always going to do his part. His promises are sure and true. He never goes against his word. The question is, are we going to do our part? You know, it seems crazy sometimes to take these big steps of faith for God. To do something that makes us uncomfortable. To do something that we think that we couldn't handle or beyond our ability, beyond our talents, beyond what we conceive of ourselves could be capable of. But here's the thing. When you find your strength in the Lord, when you trust in his promises, when you're strengthened by him... All of a sudden, all those fears towards the different ministries, so the different callings in life that God may put in your life, they're no longer fears because you're trusting in the Lord and you know that He keeps His promises. I mean, think like last month, we had um, the Marx family here as missionaries going to Portugal. Here they are, they're in their middle age, right? And they decided that they're going to give up their lives. And they're going to move thousands of miles away, leave their family behind, leave their culture behind to go and share the gospel with people that they've never met before in their life. That seems crazy to us, right? Right now, if God would so call us that we would get up, that we would leave San Francisco, we would leave the Bay, and we would move across to another country, and we would share the gospel with other people that desperately need to hear. And it seems like that would be so insane to do. But here's the thing. we got to realize that our God is big, and he's going to keep his promises. And so if we're willing to do that, God will always provide. He's always going to be there. And so all those things that cause us to fear, God is there with his promises. We don't have to be afraid. Or even let's bring it down to something even more simple. Say he's sharing a gospel. Sharing the gospel with a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker. Which can be scary. And we can become fearful of that. And we can get all in our heads like, what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if I can't answer every single question they have? Or what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And we become fearful of that until we realize that God's going to keep his promises. His word says that his word never returns void. That means God is going to work through his word if we speak it to people. 
that he's going to be able to bring people to a point of decision where they're going to reject him or accept him. But we have to be faithful to open our mouths and share the gospel, not in fear and wondering if we're going to mess it up, but trusting that the Spirit of God is more powerful in that moment than we could ever be, and then sharing the gospel faithfully. He's telling him here, I'm going to keep my promises to you so you can live faithfully for me. We can take these steps. We don't have to be afraid because God keeps his promises. And last, what he does is then he takes all those things and he does more than we can ever possibly imagine. Look at the next verses in verse 6 through 9. He says this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house, this temple, with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And watch this part. The glory of this latter house, this second temple shall be greater than all than of the former temple, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so what is he talking about here? He tells them this kind of promise. He says that this temple that they're working on to build is actually going to be more glorious than the temple that came before that was destroyed. But why is that? How is that going to be accomplished? Right? Is it because this temple that they're building is going to be more fancy than the one that Solomon built? Right? We already learned that's not the truth. Right? These, again, were kind of like people just returning to their city using rubble to build this temple. It's not going to be glorious. It's not going to be amazing by any long shot. So that can be what God means. Okay, well, maybe that first temple was destroyed. So maybe this temple that they're building is going to stand forever, and it's never going to be destroyed. But that's not it either, because eventually that temple, too, gets destroyed. Then how? How is this glory of this temple going to be greater than the former? The answer comes in these verses. We're going to read them again. Verse 7, he says this. I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And then at the end of verse 9, he says, I will give peace. See, this desire of all nations, this glory that is going to fill the house, this peace that is going to come, it's not talking about a what. <clears throat> It's talking about a who. This, in this moment, what Haggai is doing through God the Father, he is giving us a prophecy of the coming Messiah. What he's saying is that there's going to come this Messiah, this Savior, and he is going to be the ultimate desire of all nations. That he is going to be the one that's going to fill this temple with his glory. That he is going to be the one that's going to bring peace to all peoples. This was a prophecy about Jesus and the ministry that he would be fulfilling in this temple. See, when they're working humbly day in, day out at their grind, what they didn't realize is that God was going to use that temple to shine forth the glory of Jesus. These humble Israelites were building the temple day in and day out. It seemed normal. It seemed tedious. It seemed regular, everyday, mundane. But God was using it for something great. What they didn't know is that God was using their mundane for something truly magnificent. See, what these people didn't know is that when they were rebuilding the temple porches, is that that exact porch is where Jesus would sit as a 12-year-old boy teaching the scribes in the temple, and they would be amazed at his doctrine and teaching. What they didn't know is that as they are rebuilding the temple courts, is that is the exact place where Jesus would come in and flip the tables and declare to all the people that this, my father's house, will be a house of prayer and worship for all people. What they didn't realize is that as they were laying the bricks for the temple steps, 
That that is where Jesus would stand before everyone and give the prophecy of his rising again. He says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back. What they didn't realize is as they're building the inner rooms of that temple where there would hang a large curtain separating us from God, that the moment Jesus died on the cross, that curtain would be ripped in two and he would restore the relationship with God for us forever. What they didn't realize is that God was taking their humble, everyday, mundane work and using it as a platform to shine the glory of Jesus Christ to the nation. They didn't realize what they were doing, even though it seemed like nothing, even though it seemed so small, that God was going to use it to bring about the ministry of Jesus. And here's the thing about our lives. Our lives sometimes can seem so small and so mundane. We go to church week after week and we serve. And we serve. We read our Bible day after day. We share the gospel again and again. And it may seem small, it may seem insignificant, but what you don't know, What we don't know is how God is going to take all of that mundane work and he's going to use it for something miraculous to bring people to him. What we don't realize is how God can take our small acts and he can multiply them and multiply them and multiply them and multiply them to use them for his glory again and again and again. See, God is with us every single day, working in our lives, working out even in the mundane. God is with us when we're brushing our teeth. God is with us when we're at work. God is with us when we're talking with our neighbors. God is with us when we sit down at dinner. God is with us when we're getting dressed in the morning. God is with us at church. God is with us all the time, always. He is with us. And our faithfulness, our consistent walk with the Lord, day in and day out, is going to result in glories that we cannot even possibly begin to imagine. It is God that is working in our lives to do his good pleasure. And even if it means reading our Bible when we don't feel like it, getting down on our knees when we don't know what's happening to our prayers, going and serving week after week at our churches, caring for our neighbors, reaching out to the lost, even if it seems small, God can use it for something glorious. And so it's up to us to remain faithful to remain consistent day in and day out in our walk with the Lord, to be strong, to do the work of the Lord, and then watch as God can take our mundane, everyday lives, and he can turn it into something miraculous and magnificent for him. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for your love and for your care for us, and the fact that you are there for us day in and day out that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. Lord God, I thank you that you give us the opportunity to serve you, not in the high and the lows of our life, but just every day. Lord, help us to realize you're with us. Help us to realize that you are using us for your glory and help us just remain faithful and consistent to you every day. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the salvation that we experienced through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we get to live a life that brings glory to you. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.